Good morning. My name is Carly Weinman, and I'm a research associate with the Energy Democracy Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We're based in Minneapolis and have been around since 1974, uh, and we focus on ways to sustainably build wealth at the community scale, including through sensible energy policy like distributed generation. We're here today to talk in particular about rural electric cooperatives and their transition away from coal toward clean energy. I know a lot of you are directly engaging with co-ops and their members to promote clean energy, and my goal with this presentation is to leave you more equipped and confident to be effective in those sometimes um, often difficult conversations. So first, when we talk about co-ops, I think it's important to get an idea of their influence. This map shows the broad geographic reach of these utilities. They cover most of the country's geographic area and deliver power to a significant portion of the population. So what's most stunning to me about this map is imagining the clean energy resource potential in co-op service territories. So look at this and consider how much wind and solar, for example, is going untapped across this vast expanse. Uh, there are definite opportunities that are ripe for unlocking. So my assumption is that many of you interface with distribution co-ops and their members, you know, including households, businesses, basically your neighbors, if you live in a co-op service territory. But it's important to note that while these distribution co-ops play an important role in conversations about transitioning to clean energy, they're not at the top of the food chain. So pardon my crude characterizations on this slide, but I don't think they're that far off. The generation and transmission co-ops that sit at the top of this food chain are historically most averse to looking beyond coal generation. These GNT co-ops, as they're known, supply uh, power to distribution co-ops who then deliver electricity to their customers. Distribution co-ops are often locked into these almost unbelievably long-term contracts that bind them to this GNT power, which is often derived from coal. So these contracts, and specifically GNT's coal reliance, is one of the biggest factors in the clean energy conversation. So when I say long-term contracts, I mean really mega ultra long-term. Here are just a few examples of the duration of contracts between distribution co-ops and GNTs today. Uh, I don't have to tell you that we can't wait until 2045, 2050, 2055, or especially not 2070 to adjust how our utilities are sourcing power. So you can see why these contracts and GNT's strong historic reliance on coal can become a significant barrier here. So now that you have some background, it's important to understand how our co-op system works. Or maybe it would be better if I said how it's dysfunctional. We talked about the long-term contracts that handcuff distribution co-ops and in turn their members, but there are a number of other factors holding back more forward-thinking policies within these utilities. For one, co-op boards tend to like to do things the way they've always done them. There's this phenomenon where they tend to rubber stamp outdated policies that don't truly reflect the clean energy options within REACH today. And this is happening even in cases where the co-op members are clamoring for increased access to um, solar and wind and, and things like that. Um, part of this is because the same people, in many cases, have been sitting on these boards for decades. These decision-making bodies tend to skew heavily toward older white men, and the lack of diverse perspectives is pronounced. And it can also feed into the bias toward the business-as-usual approach rather than giving due consideration to very real other options. But there's another key here, and it concerns the actual member owners of these rural electric co-ops. Um, you know, simply put, they're not showing up. So the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, where I work, analyzed board election data and found that 70% of co-ops nationwide have a voter turnout in board elections of less than 10%. It's probably not surprising to anyone in this room that rural electric co-ops are not the paragon of democracy that they were perhaps designed to be, uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. 
in a lot of cases, people simply don't realize they have the opportunity, or some would say the obligation, uh, to influence the strategic directions of their co-ops through these board elections. But in more extreme cases, we've seen barriers designed specifically to prevent them from doing so. So we've seen in-person voting requirements that are a non-starter for a lot of people uh, to onerous board nomination standards that favor incumbents. Um, just things that are really designed to keep participation to a minimum. And so clearly there's some work to do, but as much as this statistic illustrates the challenge, I think it also shows an opportunity to reach a substantial portion of the affected population that isn't yet plugged in. Um, and I think that has to be how you look at it. Okay, so given all of this, how do you effectively engage with co-ops? There are three main things you need as we see it. So first, you need data. You need numbers to back up the claims you're making. We know by now that utilities don't typically embrace clean energy out of the goodness of their hearts, so making the case with numbers is really important. And one thing to keep in mind is that when co-ops were formed a century ago, their mandate was not simply to provide cheap electricity. When they were formed, it was in part to boost economic development across American farm country. And I think it's okay to remind them of this as renewables offer an opportunity to deliver those kind of economic benefits today. So after data, you need a story. You need to put a human face on your numbers so it's harder for people to tune them out. Find, say, a person, a community, a business, or even a different co-op that exemplifies what you're trying to say. When you can combine that with the data, the numbers become more real and, like I said, tougher to ignore. And lastly, and this one's really important, you need to find the right voice to deliver this information. So I think we as advocates might feel like we have the greatest depth and breadth of perspective on these issues, but we're actually often not the right conduits for delivering this information. So for example, Take me, I work in a part of Minneapolis represented by a city council member who um, is endorsed by the Green Party and I travel around town pretty much exclusively by bike. I'm not going to present as somebody to listen to in a rural electric co-op boardroom. And it's important to have that self-awareness as we figure out how to affect change in these communities. So there are better voices than me uh, and for example, these could include co-op member owners or managers and board members at uh, particularly enterprising co-ops. These are the kinds of narrators that are more accessible to your audience and more compelling to stakeholders in this conversation. So I'll close today with an example of this. Um, we produced a video at ILSR after I spent a few days in rural Iowa learning about a co-op there. Uh, that has been uh, particularly forward thinking in getting solar off the ground in a big way. So I'll leave you with that and hopefully this has been helpful.